this panel is about Medicare for All and reproductive justice. Uh, my name is Jen, uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I have uh, spent a lot of time working on uh, DSA's uh, single payer campaign for Medicare for All and the New York Health Act. Uh, I am, have also been on the leadership of the Socialist Feminist Working Group. Uh, and I'm currently trying to organize a national campaign for reproductive justice within a DSA called the Mass Strike for Reproductive Justice. Uh, check us out. Um, and on the panel, I'll be moderating. Uh, on the panel today, uh, we have Chia Nunwa, uh, who is the co-chair of New York City uh, DSA, the largest chapter of the largest socialist organization in the US. Uh, she uh, was one of the primary architects of uh, our campaign for single-payer health care. In fact, she was the one who recommended uh, that uh, SOCHFEM uh, start the campaign for New York Health Act uh, or become part of that coalition uh, and has been working uh, deeply on this campaign ever since. Uh, she's organized numerous events for this campaign uh, and worked to build relationships between a New York City DSA and the campaign citywide and statewide coalition partners. Uh, our campaign just got Hakeem Jeffries to uh, sign on to the Medicare for All bill over the summer and now we are coming out for Savina and Max Rose. Max Rose, yeah. Um, and then also on the panel is Katie McFadden. Uh, she is a midwife and former NICU nurse living and working in central Brooklyn. She recently resigned from her position as a staff nurse at SUNY Downstate University Hospital in Brooklyn, a 90% plus black serving hospital, nine times more dangerous than whiter serving institutions uh, less than 10 miles away. Described as a whistleblower and committing career suicide, Katie is currently focused on full-time activism, trying to bring attention uh, and solutions to SUNY Downstate, uh, which includes volunteering for the Campaign for New York Health to try and get New York, the New York Health Act passed in the next legislative session. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and for the 2021 legislative session, she hopes to bring experts together to craft legislation that will address state perpetuated medical racism and reproductive injustice through a process of truth, reconciliation, and reparations. Um, all right, so uh, without further ado, uh, I wanna hand it over to uh, Chi. Um. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Chi, pronoun she, her. So yeah, I think during this presentation, I'd like to touch on two major themes. Um, I wanna talk about one, how and why Medicare for all is a feminist issue and a reproductive justice issue. And two, what the fight for Medicare for all, I think reveals about the class character of certain institutions within the feminist movement and the abortion rights movement. So with respect to the first issue, why Medicare for all is a feminist issue and why we as democratic socialists view Medicare for all as a site of feminist struggle. So it's important to consider that the healthcare system we currently have in this country is very closely tied to employment and to one's relationship status and family structure. So many people are dependent on their employers for health insurance. And yet, even if you're employed, that's no guarantee that you will have insurance coverage. So for example, many employers will only provide um, you with health insurance coverage if you are, for example, a full-time salaried employee. In many cases, when it comes to people who work part-time or are freelancers or do contract work, employers will either not pay for health insurance coverage or they will cover it at a very reduced rate. So many of these workers end up paying very high premiums, high monthly premiums, despite having a very much higher level of economic precarity. And this is really relevant, especially relevant to the lives of working women, working class women, because when you look at the industries that are experiencing the highest levels of job growth, um, we're looking at industries like the retail industry, the food service industry, and the healthcare industry, especially the home health aid sector. And these are industries that employ a disproportionate number of women, and many of these jobs are part-time jobs that provide very poor benefits, including very poor health coverage benefits. So you have that problem. 
And then this is compounded by the fact that many of these women are raising children and women tend to be the primary caregivers in their households. So now there's the question of how will you get health coverage for your kids? And you know, many health plans, they will also charge additional premiums for every dependent you add on the plan. And this is true even for employer subsidized health insurance. And then compounding, all, compounding that situation, so let's say you can't get coverage from your employer at all, but then you also don't qualify for Medicaid, right? Because Medicaid has certain income restrictions that don't reflect the degree of poverty in this country. So then your options are to either buy a very expensive Obama care plan on the marketplace that you probably won't be able to use because there might be a high deductible, or you know maybe you're lucky enough to have a partner who can, or partner or spouse who can put you on their plan, but now you're dependent on your spouse and this relationship for health coverage, you know, God forbid, you know, this is an abusive relationship or, you know, you break up. So, yeah, and so, yeah, I mean, this is a very toxic situation where the healthcare system is compounding the difficulty of being poor, of being a worker in a country with very bad worker protections, of being a woman, of being a caregiver, of being a parent, and this situation makes it very difficult for people to have and raise children in safe and economically dignified environments. And so Medicare for All would decouple health care from employment, and it would relieve many working class women of a lot of these burdens. You would just have health care. You'd just be able to get health care regardless of your income or your employment status or your relationship status or your caregiving responsibilities. And this change would be really big for women in a country that expects women to do most of the caregiving work but doesn't actually provide the institutional supports needed to do so. Like I think in the US we tend to treat caregiving as a private individual responsibility instead of a social responsibility. And I think that, instead of a collective responsibility, and I think that Medicare for All would be a good step in the direction of socializing what should be collective responsibilities, which should be the goal of any good democratic socialist reform. And then the other reason, big reason why Medicare for All I think is a feminist issue is that if the bill were to pass as written, it would represent one of the biggest expansions of economic access to abortion that this country has ever seen. So Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill mandates federal funding for abortion, which would effectively nullify the Hyde Amendment, which I believe that we talked about the Hyde Amendment earlier, but for those who were not here, the Hyde Amendment is a law that was passed in 1977. It's essentially a rider on any federal budget, and it bans federal funding for abortion, which has terrible implications for low-income people, for people on Medicaid who need abortions. And so, yeah, with Medicare for All, among all the other forms of comprehensive health care that it would fund, it would also fund, it would also mandate federal funding for abortion care. And I think what's great about this aspect of Medicare for All is that by mandating federal coverage for abortion, it would potentially enshrine abortion as a positive right. So what do I mean by a positive right? So the way that abortion is codified into law right now through Roe v. Wade is as a, what is called a negative right. So it's framed as a right to privacy, a right from personal intrusion, a right to not have anyone intrude on your bodily autonomy, all of which are very important. But if we are trying to work towards a more just society, it's not enough to have negative rights. It's not enough to have rights from XYZ type of intrusion. We also need to assert positive rights too a variety of public goods, a right to health care, including abortion, a right to housing, a right to a livable climate, a right to good transportation, and so on. And so I think in the United States, and forgive me if I get a bit wonky, but I think in the United States, like historically, we've had a tradition of negative rights. Um, that's how much of our legal, that's much of our, that's like forms basis of much of our legal framework. And we're very much into this idea culturally of like, don't tread on me and like fearing the nanny state and all this. But that's not enough, especially in this current era of late stage capitalism. Like right now, I think in our current political moment, we need to create a mass movement that will establish, that will make positive demands on the state and will establish the right to um, public goods like healthcare and housing 
and a livable planet. And I think Medicare for All is a first step. It's not the whole enchilada, but it's the first step in the process of establishing more positive rights in this country. And I think Medicare for All at this political moment is the clearest realization of the demand for abortion that is safe, free, and on demand. And I think, I don't think any other approach to this fight will be as effective at making abortion actually economically accessible to everyone, which I think should be the ultimate goal of um, any reproductive justice movement. So that's my bit on why Medicare for All is a feminist and reproductive justice issue. The second thing I wanted to talk about was um, what the fight for Medicare for All reveals about class tensions within the feminist movement and the abortion rights movement. So um, I think with everything I've said here, I mean, you would think that every major feminist and reproductive rights organization would be fully on board with Medicare for All, would make that a rallying cry, but that hasn't really happened. And you know, many mainstream reproductive rights organizations Planned Parenthood being one prominent example, though it's not the only one, have either been silent on Medicare for All or have refused to endorse it. So why is that the case? Well, I think it comes down to the fact that Medicare for All is ultimately a class war. Um, it's a class war between working people and the rich and the corporate class who want to profit from our health needs and our illnesses. And I think the reality is that many of the more mainstream liberal reproductive rights nonprofit organizations, even though they provide a lot of important services and do a lot of good work, when you look at the institutional structure of these organizations and the material reality of these organizations, they unfortunately have a strong incentive to not take the right side in this class war. And I'm not saying this to slight the work these organizations do, but I do think it's important to consider the material reality of these institutions um, how that might affect their political priorities. Uh, many of these institutions are funded by the same corporations and the same millionaires and billionaires that want to deny us a right to the public goods I've talked about here. <clears throat> and a lot of these corporate interests also have a vested interest in a model where they provide funding where essential health services like abortion and other essential social services are doled out to the least fortunate in the context of charity instead of these services being a mandated essential right for everyone that isn't means tested. And with Medicare for all, our health care would be guaranteed for everyone and it would be paid through with progressive taxation instead of means tested philanthropy. And when you have a universal right like Medicare for all that's not means tested and isn't dependent on income, you're more likely to end up with a program that has a broad base of support across gender lines, racial lines, socioeconomic lines to some degree. And so, as you can imagine, many people in the corporate class don't like that. They don't like it for a Medicare for all, and they're not gonna like it if the nonprofits they fund come out in favor of this grand reform that is gonna redistribute a lot of their wealth and engender a stronger sense of solidarity across a broad swath of the working class. Especially since when you start passing something like Medicare for all, then people might start thinking, hmm, why don't we have a right to all these other things? Why don't we have a right to housing, um, transportation, and so on? And then people will just keep agitating more, and then the rich might have to distribute even more of their income, and we can't have that, obviously. So, And so I think what we're seeing with um, the fight for Medicare for all is that it really is a question of whose side are you on? Are you on the side of the working class in terms of fighting for health care and abortion rights as economic rights that everyone should be entitled to? Or are you on the side of the rich who don't really have a problem funding organizations and institutions that tend to lean into the more mainstream liberal narrative of abortion as being simply a matter of individual choice and individual autonomy and negative rights because that's a narrative that doesn't really threaten their power. And I think that by supporting Medicare for all nationally in the New York Health Act at the state level, reproductive rights organizations and leaders really have an opportunity to say, you know, we stand with the working class in the fight for reproductive justice and we recognize that abortion and healthcare more broadly is a positive economic right that we need to enshrine in this country's law. Yeah, thank you.
much for sharing that with us, Chi. And thank you guys all for being here today. Um, so my name is Katie McFadden, and I come to this work um, from being a clinician and wondering why we were facing so many challenges in the, the setting where I was closer, yeah. uh, uh, trying to look for s solutions um, to address the challenges we were encountering, um, providing adequate care in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk about how uh, um, how single payer would or universal guaranteed health care would help address uh, racial health disparities and maternal infant health outcomes and how they would help us address obstetric violence um, because I think those are two huge reproductive justice issues um, you know reproductive justice is uh, the is partially the right to have children and parent them in safe and sustainable environments. And if you give birth to a child uh, prematurely or give birth to a child that needs um, special specialized care and they're being cared for in a neonatal intensive care unit that is dangerous, that is a violation of their right to reproductive justice. Um, if they're being cared for in a NICU that has visitation policies or that is always so poorly staffed that there isn't the staff to facilitate uh, parents holding their children or interacting with their children, they don't have the right to parent. Um, and that is a violation of their reproductive right. Um, in New York City, uh, black babies are three times more likely to die than white babies by their first birthday, and black birthing people are 12 times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes than white birthing people are. Um, and this is pretty, um, I'm involved, I'm a volunteer with Agent Song Doula Services, which is a reproductive justice-based uh, doula organization that both trains doulas and helps provide um, free and affordable doula services to women uh, based in bed -Stuy. And within the black birthing community, it is well known, the higher rates of poor outcomes. And it is, um, and it's, it's something that people fear. Like I talk to my black friends who are my age who are thinking about having babies and one of the things they are taking into consideration is whether or not they would survive the experience in New York City. And so if you don't feel the safety to get pregnant and, and give birth because of the medical racism and the structural racism making it dangerous to give birth in New York City, that is an infringement on your reproductive right. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I wanna talk about how a single payer can kind of uh, address those issues. Um, so in New York, I just shared the the disparities, three to one for infants and 12 to one for the maternal mortality rates. Um, and those numbers have been getting a decent amount of press within the past couple of years. What has gotten significantly less attention is research that shows that about half of that disparity in New York City is because of a lower quality of care provided at a concentrated set of minority serving hospitals. So, um, uh, uh, Dr. Howell, who is an obstetrician at Mount Sinai, um, did a research study where um, she looked at if uh, the complication rates at various hospitals um, by the ethnicities served, and that if black women were to attend the same hospitals that white women were going to, the complication rate would be halved. And the same proved true when they looked at outcomes in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, so in Dr. Howell's research, those hospitalized hospitals are anonymized um, because the of the way research, you know, I wouldn't have been able to get funding and I, no research hospitals would have uh, participated in this research if they weren't anonymized. Okay. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, I, we can't prove on paper which hospitals are the ones with incredibly high complication rates, except for that we can. Uh, because if you, you know, if I, uh, I've been a, a bedside nurse for five years in New York City, I trained as a midwife here and uh, had clinicals at four different hospitals. Um, and a lot of my friends from college are, did their medical residencies in New York City. So I, 
I have like a first degree contact at over half the hospitals in New York City and a second degree contact at every hospital in New York City. Um, and they're really, in Brooklyn, there are only three that are predominantly black serving. And in the, oh sorry, uh, there, in Brooklyn there are only three that are overwhelmingly black serving. And um, in a recently, in a database that was made available after Dr. Howell's research was published, it showed that the severe maternal morbidity rate at those hospitals were six to nine times higher than the rate at Maimonides, which is a predominantly white serving hospital. So, um, so, okay, so hospitals are a huge part of the problem. What is going on at SUNY Downstate, Kings County, and Brookdale hospitals for them to have complication rates so much higher than these other hospitals. Well, the quality of care is different at these hospitals because the funding structure is different at these hospitals. When we, the, the private public insurance system that we have in New York is a separate and unequal insurance system that ensures, like it's the, you know, we know from American history we don't have separate systems that produce equal results. Um, in obstetric, uh, for obstetric, obstetric care, Medicaid and public insurance reimburses at about half of the rate that private insurance reimburses for. And about two thirds, because of historic um, and ongoing racial segregation, economic disenfranchisement, uh, two-thirds of black birthing people are on Medicaid, whereas two-thirds of white birthing people are on private insurance. And so what happens is if you overlap that insurance segregation on top of residential segregation, is you have hospitals where almost all of the patients they see are on an insurance that reimburses at half of the rate of other hospitals that serve a predominantly private, uh, privately insured um, population, and like, just we can use we can use our, our thinking cabs to know that if you have half as much money, you're going to be able to afford half as many doctors, half as many nurses, half as many lab techs, half as many X-ray machines. When things go wrong, we can't fix it as quickly. When somebody quits, we can't replace them. Um, so I would work shifts at SUNY Downstate where we had. Hat, we, like we would have seven nurses on like, you know, when I talk about understaffing, it's not like we should have had eight or nine nurses and we had seven, it's we should have had 14 or 15 nurses and we had seven. Um, we, there are 12 specialties missing from the NICU at SUNY Downstate and three of them are required by state regulations. Um, and so, you know, I kept asking my bosses like, how are we getting the designation that our NICU has of providing the level of care. How are we keeping getting that renewed? We haven't had these specialties here for years. And she's just like, mm, I submit the paperwork and they approve it. What? Um, so we, uh, so essentially like we have, um, Sorry, um, so in New York City, the like insurance acts as a proxy to segregate people into better and worse care. And the simplest way to fix that, the that driving force of um, of of quality segregation of like institutions being segregated and the quality being uh, provided they're being segregated, the easiest way to end that is we put us all on the same insurance. Because if the reimbursement rate is the same for everybody, then every hospital has the access to the same resources to provide care. And if we realize that the reimbursement rate is not adequate to employ all of the specialists that you would need at that facility, well, that doesn't just affect folks who have already been racially segregated and politically disenfranchised, it affects everybody and now everybody is clamoring for, we need to pay you know, doctors and nurses and hospitals more because we want a better quality of care. Um, and then, uh, so, so yeah, uh, I just, like when we think, I think a very important shift that many 
frankly, white healthcare providers um, and white people who are following health disparities, a shift that we need to make is to not see race as a risk factor, but to understand that it is racism that is the risk factor. Um, and we know that there is nothing biologically different about black people that make them susceptible to worse birth outcomes. There's something profoundly wrong with how black birthing people are treated in our society that makes them more susceptible to worse birth outcomes. Outcomes. And when we accept, like, when we firmly root ourselves in that understanding, then it forces us to look at, well, what are the different environments that we have created? How is our society differently treating these populations? And the insurance segregation um, is a huge driving force of that. Um, the other thing, so kind of like wrapped into. Uh, wrapped into that is sometimes I, sometimes when I talk about SUNY Downstate, Kings County, and Brookdale at length, I don't wanna give the impression that if you go to New York Presbyterian or Mount Sinai or, or NYU, you're going to have a respectful, uh, patient-centered, woman-centered experience in giving birth to your babies there. Um, I, obst obstetric violence is uh, endemic in all of the United States, and I think it is particularly worse in New York City for um, for a variety of reasons. Um, that, uh, but and and one of the ones that factors into it is the incredible challenges that midwives face practicing in New York City. Um, so. Uh, Um, no. Okay. Like, you know, yeah, keep going. Oh, sure. Like five more or less. Sure. Um, so, just like a, a brief history of birthing care, um, but midwives have been catching babies since as, as long as people have been giving birth to babies. Obstetrics was invented in in, in the eighteen. What? Oh, sorry. Uh, obstetrics was invented in the 1800s as a medicine to increase the birth rate on slave plantations for the economic gain of the slave owners. Um, and so the fact that obstetric violence, like the history of violence in obstetrics is really just the history of obstetrics because it was never intended to center the needs of the birthing person. Um, it was always, the contract was with the slave owner, not with the people who were giving birth. And then think slavery wasn't that long ago, and especially in, in like medical years, slavery uh, for sure wasn't that long ago because the doctors who have power and are in prevalence now in New York City were are trained in the 80s. And they were trained by doctors who were trained in the 40s, who were trained, in the who were trained during slavery. So we're really only like three or four generations separated from that mentality. Um, midwives who often are practice a, a woman or a, a birthing person-centered model of care in New York City uh, face like insurance won't reimburse us so home birth midwives will catch babies and even though an insurance company pays about a third as much to a home birth midwife as they would have to pay to a hospital to cover that birth they just will sit on it and like not reimburse the midwife at all and it becomes like essentially a petition game within the home birth community of New York City of clients and home birth midwives like taking turns calling the insurance company just trying to get reimbursed. Um, a lot of home, um, uh, insurance companies will do things like they have one home birth midwife in network so if if you can't see her then like they put it, it's like your fault that that one midwife <laughs> had a full client schedule. Um, there's just like in every way insurance companies can screw midwives over and make it near impossible for us to practice independently, um, they have. And it is, I, I was just last, 
last week or two weeks ago at the New York City Midwives meeting and like the whole hour session of the Midwives meeting was how to navigate a million different insurance companies with a million different rules. Um, and so the, the people who, um, you know, midwives, I mean, I have, I have a slightly idealized version of midwifery, uh, but, you know, I see midwives as, as the wisdom keepers for their community. We, like, we know how humans get into this world and, like, we know how to help humans get into this world. That's a cool skill. Like, that's, a, I think, a socially valuable profession. Um, and instead of being able to be leaders in our communities of, about how to make you know, a healthy species propagate. Instead, we are just trying to get paid. Um, we're just trying to break even with a, a broken and fragmented insurance landscape that often pushes us to take jobs at hospitals where we have no independence and we become a cog in the machine of the, the policies and practices that lead to obstetric violence. Um, so going to single payer would simplify the insurance landscape and there's no guarantee that the New York Health Act is going to like automatically have good reimbursement situation to facilitate the models of care that would um, decrease obstetric violence, but it would give us one organization to lobby to change it instead of a million. Because where we're at now, it's there's you know there's too few midwives. There's um, there are almost more insurance companies than midwives in New York City. So there's really would be no way for us to organize in advance um, as a as a profession and to provide that option to birthing people in New York. Um, awesome, thank you, G and Katie, uh, for uh, uh, those two great uh, discussions. Um, sorry, my head is like swimming. Like, I didn't know about the, the origins of obstetrics. Uh, wow, um, okay, so I wanna start with like a little, maybe questions and answers. I have a couple of questions um, for you two, uh, and then we're gonna open it up to the group. Um, so I would say, um, right, uh, Medicare for All is on the horizon, right? Hopefully in 2020 when we have uh, President Sanders uh, and Medicare for All uh, becomes an act, you know, something that's actually possible, right? Uh, and not just a, a pipe dream. Uh, I think there's an understanding that, um, you know, our strategy with legislation is you aim for what you want, right? You aim for the stars, and then you're going to recognize that you're probably going, that legislation is going to be whittled down um, to a certain extent. Um, and I think a lot of uh, reproductive justice organizers are concerned, right, that this, uh, this fantastic legislation that would get rid of the Hyde Amendment um, could be weakened, right, and that our uh, ability to access reproductive care could be used as a bargaining chip against the Republicans. Um, so with this information, um, how do you think we should be centering reproductive care within the fight for Medicare for all? Uh, I don't, you know more about the Hyde Amendment than me, so I'll let you see. Sure. Um, so yeah, I was, I was thinking about this question last night and um, I think there are a few ways that we could center, better center reproductive justice within the fight for Medicare for all. So I think one point to remember about both the fight for Medicare for all and the fight for abortion rights um, is that what we're talking about in both cases is sort of an opposition to democracy from the elite. Right, like Medicare for all is a broadly popular program. It's not a fringe demand. And similarly, support for abortion among the American po among the U.S. populace has actually been steadily increasing. Um, the vast majority of Americans did not support the rather extreme abortion bans that we saw this year, for example. And when people are polled on whether or not they support abortion for any reason, that number has also been steadily increasing since the 70s. And so what we're seeing with Medicare for all and abortion rights is um, 
a very small elite that has pretty much rigged the system to support a number of fringe reactionary policies that are actually not supported by the majority of the American public. And I think if you, if there is a way to sort of tailor our messaging when in organizing and canvassing to really emphasize that this is a fight for our democracy, this is a fight for mass democracy, and this is a fight against a rich elite that hates democracy, essentially, I think that could be effective. Um, I think it's also important to keep in mind, as Jen said, that um, by virtue of having a Medicare for All bill that is very comprehensive and would cover everyone of every demographic, there is the potential for the right wing to try to fracture the Medicare for All coalition by attacking, say, the abortion provisions or the provisions for immigrant and undocumented health care. And so, I mean, again, I think Medicare for All is a good first step towards abortion access for everyone, but I think it's not, I don't know if it's sufficient on its own. I think we also, I think we on the left also need to make just a stronger positive case for abortion rights. I think that um, we have ceded a lot of rhetorical ground to the right over the last few decades. They've really, yeah, they're really kind of, they have the hegemony on the rhetorical game. And I think we on the left have not really done enough to make a positive case for why we need abortion, not just as a right to privacy, but also as a positive economic right for everyone who would need that, that service. Um, yeah, I mean, how dare you call yourself pro-life if you don't support Medicare for all when people, te you know, tens of thousands of people die every year because of lack of uh, medical coverage. Um, and I, I, I agree, right, that the left is the only one that is really putting forward a vision of what a dignified life looks like, right? What, you know, giving... Uh, each and every one of us, our own ability to live lives of our choosing, or just to live, right? Uh, when we have a world of mass incarceration, of police brutality, of climate crises and closed borders. Um, uh, and I, I, I agree, right, that the only way that we can solidify these gains is to fight back and get active and bring in members of our community and rise up, um, because it's truly going to take a mass movement of everyday people fighting for themselves uh, to win these things. Um, else? Yeah. So I'm like I'm learning as I go in the political and activism world. Um, so I don't have, but my my instinct is of how to center reproductive justice and not like give away is to my instinct is to talk about white supremacy and male supremacy a lot because I think like when we really understand the origins of like why didn't we go to single payer in the first place well it was a segregated white medical institution the AMA that didn't want to be forced to treat black patients and opposed it um, the like the you know taking out reproductive care from universal, you know, to afraid, you know, the free abortion on, um, free abortion on demand, it should be free health care on demand, and abortion is health care. Mm. And to allow any of that to get separated is to concede to the, to male, and white and male supremacist forces and arguments. And so I think for, especially for me as a white person growing up in a segregated white area of upstate New York who has had very little exposure to what, what racism is, what is anti-racism, how do I do that? I think for me um, engaging in anti-racism work is kind of painting the picture where I can see us making art like is helping me learn how to make arguments where we don't just, like where we can't concede little bits because there are no little bits to concede. It's all a, a whole thing together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one other point I was just, I was thinking about uh, while Chi was speaking before about like what, 
Medicare for all would or wouldn't do. Um, and I think, right, what she said was absolutely correct. It's the first step. Um, but I th And I think it would open up room uh, for more, right? Um, you know, I was, I was talking to a friend on Twitter a while ago about, like, what, how can we expand abortion access, um, you know, beyond just Medicare for all? And that's things like making sure abortion training happens in medical school, which often, right, like doctors don't get trained on how to perform abortions, right? There's no reason uh, nurse practitioners can't perform abortions, right? They insert IUDs. It's, have you, uh, I, if you haven't taken a pills and papaya workshop where you learn how to admit, you know, do an abortion on a papaya, highly recommend it. Super fun. It's basically the same thing as an IUD, except you like stick a vacuum thing up there instead of a little, you know, IUD. Um, right? There's no reason that nurse practitioners cannot do that. Uh, there's no reason why medical abortions aren't available over the counter like Plan B is, right? Um, and these are sort of things that I think, like you said, right, by instead of uh, by having a unified single payer program, there is one governmental body that we could target for these demands, right, um, as a way of, you know, not only equalizing health insurance, but expa uh, expanding the care that we're able to access. Um, anyway, um, so how much more time do we have? 15 minutes, okay. Um, I wanna hear from you guys. What are your questions? What are your experiences? Yeah, you in the pink coat. The, I appreciated the two, you know, the two presenters because there was information that I hadn't heard before, a way of talking about Medicare for all. But I was wondering, like, it's a good demand that we have to push for because it opens people's eyes to what is possible or what is needed out there. But we have Democrats and we have Republicans that will water it down, that will delete something like they've deleted, you know, a lot of other issues along the way that we fought for. So it's more of a systematic problem. You know, we have to be able to run candidates that are not connected to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Um, and so I'm wondering, do you see it more as a, you know, a fight to change the system, uh, you know, eventually. You know, I, I agree that it's a good reform because it tells us what we need. The other thing is, in terms of the rate of effects on uh, the birth rate and, you know, children living past one years of age, I'm from Newark and we have the lead crisis going on there, which is also in New York City, I'm sure, because of the old pipes. And how much does environmental racism play into all of this, you know, in terms of the birth rates? Mm -hmm. And I smile because I spent the last month reading papers about environmental racism and birth outcomes. So actually, I have something smart to say. Um, so uh, great. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the disparities question, um, but so we, in New York City, we know about half of the disparity comes from hospital quality, so that leaves the question, what's causing the other half of the disparity? And I think when we zoom in on the, like, the non-hospital factors, environmental racism does play a, a large role in that. Um, so for some examples, uh, when Easy Pass went into effect, um, and it decreased the traffic congestion near toll plazas. The premature birth rate for birthing people who lived within two kilometers of a toll plaza dropped by 10%. And black women were much more likely to live in uh, areas closer to toll plazas because those were slightly less desirable areas to live and were more socioeconomically disadvantaged. So the difference, uh, um, so, Oh, we black women are between one and a half to two times more likely to give birth prematurely, and when you, um, and so I think like probably ten to twenty five percent of that difference in premature birth rates just comes from air pollution exposure, um, or at least in areas that that has been the case. There was a when coal and oil fire. Um, 
when coal and oil power plants shut down in California, the preterm birth rate dropped 27% for birthing people who lived within five kilometers. And of people who lived within five kilometers, black birthing people lived 2.1 away, Hispanic uh, people lived on average 2.6 kilometers away, and white birthing people lived on average 3.4 kilometers away. And with air pollution, there's like a huge, uh, you know, it's not a linear distribution with the distance. Um, so, so uh, you know, it's, it would, it's hard to say like, each metric for each outcome is different, but I think there is a huge, uh, you know, something, uh, the, you know, those, the amount that environmental racism plays, those percentages are much larger than the purported influence that a college education has on the differences in birth outcomes, has a much, is, you know, as big as differences in age between, uh, uh, the maternal age between differences in age between racial categories and you hear a lot of people saying like oh well you know if if moms were more educated and if they ate their vegetables and you know if they did this that and the other thing maybe birth outcomes would be better and you never hear anybody talking about going after the the petroleum industry um, so Yes, and right, like this, once we fix hospital quality, disparities will still exist, and that's, you know, that's where we tackle environmental racism, interpersonal racism of the, you know, interactions people are having with their providers, and all of the, all of the other racisms that come into creating those disparities. Um, that's the, yeah, yeah, do you wanna say, I mean, I think to uh, your first question, about, um, right, like we're trying to achieve social, socialism within a deeply ingrained capitalist system. So I guess, I don't know, do you want uh, to say something about like, uh, what's the term, like revolutionary reforms? Non-reformist. Non -reformist. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't know if this will answer your question, but I think in the DSA we view Medicare for All as a non-reformist reform. We view it as a reform that has the potential to radicalize a large swath of the American public and get people thinking about, so once you decommodify this one public good, you get people thinking about decommodifying other types of public goods. And I think to your point about Republicans and Democrats, I mean, I agree that both parties are a problem and for that reason we are targeting um, elected officials in both parties. I mean, both parties are beholden to various corporate interests that don't support Medicare for all, but I do think that um, I do think that electoral strategy is one tactic among many that we can use as socialists to um, move towards a better world. Um, Julie, I think you had you have a question, and then yeah, do you want to um, get uh, her too in the floral shirt? Okay. My question was, um, so insurance companies, health insurance companies, have a lot of money and lobbyists and all that. So how do we get Medicare for all without burning all the health insurance companies to the ground? <laughs> I mean, I don't care about burning them to the ground. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say, Julie. Why, why, why stop there? You know? <laughs> I, mean, can, can we do, I just want to go back to... Um, what someone raised earlier, Jen, which is this notion that, you know, if we get to the point where Medicare for all is a real, genuine possibility, and we're about to get it, I think we can guarantee that reproductive rights, particularly abortion, will be pulled out of the plan in order to appease the right and the, the, the center, unless... We're, we're powerful enough to stop that from happening. And I just think that we have to think hard about what we're gonna do between now and then to make sure that doesn't happen and not just wait until a year or two or three from now to start working on that. I, I honestly believe that the only way that that's not gonna happen is if there's a big, strong, loud, bold feminist movement that they are worried about, that they have to, be, if, they, if they get ready to pull that, meaning basically the Democrats' interests get ready to pull that, they go, 
uh, we got to be careful because that crazy group of feminists is going to overwhelm us, and we're going to, you know, they're going to follow us everywhere, and there's going to be tens of thousands of them out in the streets and all of that. And it doesn't happen at the last minute. You got to build for that, and we need to be building organizations now that are ready to do that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree that, um, yeah, I agree that we will need a mass movement to not only win Medicare for all, but also ensure that it doesn't get watered down into nothingness. And I agree that we need to start laying the groundwork for that right now. Um, not just building a base for Medicare for all, but building a base for the idea that Medicare for all needs to include abortion care. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think a big task ahead of us is making you know, some of our more liberal feminist allies recognize this as well. Um, recognize that the fight for abortion needs to be an economic fight. It needs to be a class war fight. I think everyone in this room gets that, but I don't know that if, I don't know how much people outside this room necessarily understand that intuitively. So there's a lot of base building work and talking to our neighbors work that we have to do. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Um, just about the people who work at health insurance companies, I mean, if somebody told me tomorrow we could end premature birth, I sure hope that NICU nurses and neonatologists wouldn't be like, well, then we'd be out of a job. Like, great. <laughs> like, if, what we want is to end premature birth, and then we can do other things with our life. Um, so I think there is, there are, there are fair and equitable ways that we can ensure people who rely on their job in the health insurance industry can transition to other places, but it is that, you know, it's a parasite on our society and it is killing people. Um, so let's, it's not any individual person's, well, some individual person's fault. Uh, lower level people who are answering the phone, like obviously we care about their economic security as much as we care about anybody else's. So let's make sure there's some transition, you know, there's money in the transition when we go to Medicare for all to make sure they can become um, doulas and doctors and nurses and the missing healthcare professionals we've had too few of previously because insurance companies wouldn't let us <laughs> hire everyone we needed to. Um, and then just thinking about like, I. I hear lots of people talking about like if Medicare for all may be a reality one day, but the New York Health Act is a reality next year. We are one vote short from getting the New York Health Act passed. And if we can get it passed in New York and get it working in New York and people see that like it's not apocalypse when you go to universal guaranteed health care, then I think it's much more likely for Medicare for all to um, to come underway. So we're like probably, you know, we are, we're, a f the distance to get uh, the, the right number of sponsors for Medicare for All is a, a long one. We are one vote short in the Senate. And there are 10, or sorry, there are nine Democratic state senators, two of whom campaigned saying they would support the New York Health Act that we can target and try to flip. And I think like enough of them are close enough to the fence that especially if there is, if they're getting calls every day, if they are, people are showing up with uh, petitions and our canvassing, and it's clear that there is enough of a movement to support a primary challenger if they don't get on board, uh, then we could get their votes and have this next year. Um, so I think as New Yorkers, uh, like, you know, there's, as New Yorkers, the, the strategically, I think we should, uh, you know, be focusing as much or more on our state senators than we are on our federal Congress people, because getting NIA passed in New York, getting NIA working in New York, could be the the transformation on the national level of what helps America go to universal guaranteed. Mm -hmm. I think we had one more question. Yeah, one more. Yeah, I just had a comment. Um, uh, the, this whole idea that you could um, jettison abortion out of uh, Medicare for All and that would make it more popular among Republicans, that didn't work. In fact, it was the reason that reproductive justice was invented in the 90s. So, um, and I think we should counter with, no, having free abortions is going to make it really popular, especially among young people, frankly, because that's like the kind of health care that reproductive health care was, 
when I was young, that was the kind of health care that I needed mostly, and having all of that be free is a big selling point. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions? And then maybe the panelists can wrap up. What? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want well, I wanted to say one thing, and then we have some like action items about how we can actually uh, fight and organize uh, for Medicare for all. Um, but I just I, to, un, to just underline this point once again about like how do we protect reproductive health care and Medicare for all? Like we are building that movement that is capable, right? Like every time we go on Canvas, every time we organize these events and we share our knowledge with each other, we are building our skills and our relationships in order to actually have that power and able to um, pressure our representatives to do what we want, right? Like my favorite um, uh, definition of organizing is building our, uh, building our capacity to disrupt, which we do by building our base, which we do by building uh, relationships and giving people meaningful ways to involve, get involved. And that is how we are going to, that is how we are currently building a movement that is capable of protecting and enshrining abortion into a national universal single payer health care plan. Um, you know, each and every one of, you know, look around the room, right? We are the ones who are going to do it. It is our skills, our experience, our relationship, our work that is going to um, enshrine these things into law. Um, and with that, I just want to hand it over to, like, so how can people get involved in this movement? Yeah, so um, there are a few ways you can get involved in this movement in New York City. Um, we actually have a table with more information back there. But... Um, you can pick up any literature. You can also sign up to get involved with DSA's, DSA's healthcare campaign with the link on the table. But um, with respect to Medicare for all, so as Jen said earlier, we flipped Hakeem Jeffries to support it earlier in the year, and now we're doing the same. We're trying to do the same with Max Rose in Staten Island. Um, Max Rose's district also happens to overlap a bit with Diane Savino's district. So Diane Savino is the state senator in part of Staten Island. She is the last person in the five boroughs who is not signed on to the New York Health Act. So the plan is to start having canvassing and tabling with the goal of getting people to call and pressure Max Rose and Diane Savino to get them to flip on the New York Health Act and Medicare for All, respectively. Um, we're also having um, canvases, Medicare for all canvases for um, the Bernie 2020 campaign because we recognize that in addition to getting the necessary majorities we need in the state and national legislatures, we also, Bernie Sanders also represents a really big opportunity for us to win Medicare for all. He is the biggest champion of this bill. So if any of that appeals to you, please um, talk to me after um, yeah, talk to me. I'll be here for a bit. And you can also get our literature in the back table over there, as well as literature about the New York Health Act. Am I missing it? Um, so, uh, so I don't have an official role with any of the single payer um, organizations. Uh, but I am trying to start a campaign to, on top of all of the insurance issues at SUNY Downstate, there are three SUNY hospitals, SUNY Upstate and SUNY Stony Brook, which are predominantly white serving, get $50 million a year in the state budget, and SUNY Downstate doesn't because Governor Cuomo is a racist. I think that's, I mean, I've looked into this issue for a while, and that's really the only explanation I have. Um, so even uh, the, the challenges that we face at, at Downstate won't result, even if we pass NIA next session, they're still going to take a while for the financial structures to uh, really address the danger issues at the hospitals in central Brooklyn. Um, so if you, especially if you live in Brooklyn, especially if you live in central Brooklyn, I'd love to have you get involved with that campaign uh, or with the campaign that I'm working on developing. And like it will be doing essentially dual trying to get the $50 million while we're trying to get the last vote for NIA because they need to go together to fix, um, to fix the Central Brooklyn Hospitals. So I'd love to speak with you afterwards if that describes you. Cool. All right. That's it.